All right, so we are here today at the Fender facility in Corona, California, and as you can probably tell from the backdrop behind me, we're gonna learn about all things EVH. They're gonna take us through the entire EVH brand, all the products today, and we're gonna pick their brains, find out what they have to say about how these products came to be. All right, so I'm here with Mr. Chip Ellis, and he's gonna take us through the construction of a Wolfgang guitar at the Fender slash EVH facility here in Corona. And so what are we looking at right here? These are cut spreads. Now, these are for the uh, custom model. We have mahogany with a maple top, and once we put these on the CNC machine, this is all that's left of them. And we cut them right over here. So we'll get that. These are the necks that are going to go with that body. So these are halfway through the process. We've got the veneer on the headstock with the inlay, ebony board. This is waiting for the, uh, the pearl inlay on the fingerboard. These are our bolt-on necks for the standard USA. This is where we put our uh, graphite reinforcement rods. We're going to start loading these with a two-way truss rod as well. So that's going to be an improvement you'll see in the future. How much graphite goes into the neck? Not this much. <laughs> Just that much. Okay. So these are the stiffener rods. So with these standing on end, you just can't flex these things. You turn them sideways and they will, but it really helps back up what the truss rod's doing. And it's really handy considering it's an unfinished neck. It's susceptible to climate changes and okay. things like that. So it really helps keep everything stiff and keep everything in place. So it's a reliable guitar that you can, if you're touring, going from East Coast to West Coast, you don't have to worry about the neck moving too much. Did you perceive any kind of tonal changes when you added the graphite? You know, we didn't really notice anything. And we definitely tried it either which way. I mean, when we first started with the Wolfgang project, we were doing traditional one-way truss rods, two-way truss rods, with graphite, without graphite. We tried everything. And we ended up going with the graphite. I mean, it didn't sound any different, but it sure helped it hold yeah, up. Structurally, yeah, structurally, it definitely is an improvement. We're going to start doing a lot more with Ebony, which is definitely a new thing for Eddie Van Halen because most of his stuff is made and it has been made for years, but he's really gravitated to it. And that's one thing that's really cool about Ed is that he's constantly evolving. I mean, he's never stick with one thing permanently. He's always looking for the next best thing. So it's been really cool. He always challenges us in that respect. So he went right from Maple to Ebony. There was no Rosewood. We, we, we did there. try some rosewood, okay. but he ended up settling on the ebony. He knew he okay. wanted to do something different, but once we gave him that stealth model with the ebony fingerboard, that was that. He was okay. alone, so. Stuff in progress. These are for the stealth model. These will have the dot inlays. Standard Wolfgang. And then these are our custom bodies. For the uh, set neck. Hard tail. And more traditional control layout, right? You know, two volumes, two tones. And maple just... on mahogany. Yes, maple on mahogany. Okay, with a big slab of mahogany. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we went really thick with this. We wanted to keep it more traditional, fatten it up a little bit. So these are uh, these are basically the same necks that you saw over there, but the back shape's been carved on them, and these are uh, ready for binding. And that's a mahogany neck on the customs as yes. well. Yes. And you can see on this one, we've extended the uh, the graphite rods into the headstock because that's always been a problem with mahogany necks. Is that you know they'll snap. I oh mean, yeah. I'm sure you've seen lots of Les Pauls with broken necks. Yeah, I own one. A lot of people do. So we extended them out to about that far on the headstock. So if it takes a hit, it's what a great idea. It. But back in this corner is where we uh, we store all of our wood. And we like to just buy a lot of it to sit on for a while and just really maintain a safety stock because a lot of the woods we use sometimes become unavailable. Like this is a bunch of uh, flame tops that will eventually end up on wolf games. These are the uh, the basswood spreads that we use when we bolt on models. So we have a bunch of flame here as well. And we're using 5A flame now. We were using a 2A quilt, but now we're doing 5A flame. And these are going to be the mahogany custom models here. And we try and get the mahogany as wide as we can because we like to do uh, one-piece bodies instead of, you know, two-piece right. as much as possible. So, wow. This Here's is our wood guru, one. Pat McGarry. Uh, How long have you been doing this, Pat? Uh, since 1982. 1982. Set neck? Set neck. Uh, 
So it really does come from just almost a tree. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, 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 the climate in here is obviously fine for storing all this, but then we'll, do they go into a hot room or anything? Yeah, we do have a hot room. We do try and rely on our vendors as much as possible to supply wood that's already been kiln dried, but sometimes it'll absorb moisture and shipping or something like that. So we've set up a hot room over here. So we do everything in small batches. These are uh, center blanks. These are going to be necks for the customs. These are all the finger boards. These are uh, floor mahogany. So if we get anything that's over like 8% moisture content, we'll go ahead and put it in here and just check it every week and see where it goes. Over here is where we do all the binding. This is where he trues the finger boards, gets them dead flat, no lump. These are prepared for binding, they're going to be cutting the binding table on these. And these are uh, next to the edge of the process. What he'll do is he'll go ahead and bend these pieces on, glue this end piece in, and then go ahead and heat these up and free bend them, let them cool, then come back to it later for the outer band of binding. He's chopping in the press with a mallet. Are they glued in as well? Yes, they are glued in as well. Uh, what he'll do is he'll just cap them in lightly with that. Uh, these are bodies that have just been bound and sanded. These are about to go into the paint department. <laughs> these are a couple of things we're just trying out when we're doing a black outer band to find a These are some of the, the newer flame models. Yeah. Doing the final sanding on one of the. Uh, Another thing I like about the custom model is that we use a really big bone nut. It's a full quarter inch wide on this thing. Wow. So that way you see a lot of like older guitars where the bone nut kind of snaps off yeah. the low E string. Probably not going to happen with that. We tried to make this thing bulletproof. It's about a hand work that goes into oh, all yeah. of it. Yeah, very much so. These are uh, getting free stained before we uh, blow the trans color on, really kind of makes the, the grain pop more. Just the, the red, black, and then the white. Um, and then these came when the tour started. But it was all for the tour. That he had to play one, play each, hand stripes them, plays them for one song. Right. And then they go to auction. So. Right now they're assembling a Wolfgang pickups. So these bobbins have already been wound. So this is Joe and he's finishing up uh, the Wolfgang right now. Before anything leaves the door, we think Joe is playing a man named Riff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's your go-to riff that you play to test him? Um, I guess Alpha Teacher. Okay. <laughs> Despite the size of this 
this factory, the guys that make this stuff are completely broken off from the fender line. They're their own separate entities, so. So it's kind of cool to have just a small team of guys. You don't have to run around looking for different people. I mean, right. you know, then that small handful of guys, any answer you need is there for you. How many, how many people are working on the EVH guitars? There's probably only about 30 people total. Okay, wow. And after they get built out, they uh, come over here for packing. We have a final inspector come over and triple check everything before we put it in the box. Everything's got to be perfect on it or else it goes back through the, back through the system. And they can be pulled at any time if somebody spots something that mm -hmm. they don't feel quite right about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been times I've been down here where these guys probably hate me for it, but I'll walk down and notice something. Nope, start over. <laughs> Is there any other instrument in the industry that has a hard tail with a locking down on it? Yeah, nope, I think we're the first on that. Okay. I'm guessing we'll just stay in tune for a freaking month. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, when I was messing with one, the, the USA Trans Amber, when I, if the strings are stretched, and, and I play a lot of, I pick very hard, I fret very hard, and as long as the strings are stretched, once it's in tune, you can't knock it out of tune. It's awesome. And the fine tuner goes back pretty far. I mean, you can easily go a step, step and a half, you know? So it's just, you can pound on it, bend on it. To me, it was like, why didn't I have one of these when I did my last record? It would have been so perfect to record with, because it just locks it, you know? It's just dead nuts on. And it translates to the customer as well. The customers now, people that are going to be playing live in their bands, no matter what style of music, it's just quicker, you just jump to it, be able to stay in tune, keep that stability amongst the band live. Just from one instrument, you can kind of set the pace of where everybody needs to be. Right. It's become a lead instrument again, you know what yeah. I mean?